Welcome to the AscendX Summit on National Security Space. Please welcome Dan Dumbacher, the Executive Director of AIAA. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Welcome to the AscendX Summit on National Security Space. I'm Dan Dumbacher, the Executive Director of AIAA, the largest professional society for aerospace. The AIAA team is thrilled to continue the Ascend journey with the next part of the AscendX Summit series. As we have been planning for the inaugural digital Ascend event in November, we have been overwhelmed by the engagement and the high quality content ideas that were submitted by the community. The summit is a chance to share some of those contributions. So we have an inspiring and impactful program for you today, featuring presentations, panels, and workshops that can help you stay up to date on the future of national security space priorities and policies, and get a taste of the content and discussions that will be part of the Apex Ascend event from 16 to 18 November. Today's event will cover key topics, including national security space, digitalization and cybersecurity, enabling infrastructure and policy, and the next generation of commercial astronauts, as well as a special bonus track available only to the registrants of the November Ascend event. A special thank you to the Aerospace Corporation as the National Security Space track sponsor and to Aerojet Rocketdyne for sponsoring the Warfighting Domain and Evolution, a future architecture session. The sessions today are all live. So if you have a question for the speakers to address during the session, please click the chat button above the video window, then add your question or comment to the chat box below the video window. You may need to refresh your browser tab to ensure this loads. To kick things off, I am thrilled to introduce a good friend and colleague, Steve Asakowitz, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Aerospace Corporation. Steve is a recognized leader across the government and private sectors in the fields of space and technology. In his current role, he directs the Aerospace Corporation as a leading architect for the country's national security and civil space programs. Prior to the Aerospace Corporation, Steve served as Chief Technology Officer and later as President of Virgin Galactic Space Ventures Business, as well as the Deputy Associate Administrator for the Exploration Systems Mission Directorate at NASA. Steve has also spent time at the White House Office of Management and Budget and Lockheed Martin. He is also a co-author of the AIAA's International Reference Guide to Space Launch Systems. Throughout his career, Steve's leadership has been recognized through numerous awards and citations, including NASA's Outstanding Leadership Medal and the Presidential Distinguished Rank Award. After Steve's presentation, there will be a few questions from the audience moderated by Rob Meyerson, Ascend executive producer and former president of Blue Origin. And now, please enjoy a video and welcome Mr. Steve Asakowitz. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dan, for that wonderful introduction. I'm excited to be joining you all here today. Um, I cut my teeth at the AAA making my first public presentation many decades ago, so it's always exciting to be back here. Also, I want to do a special thanks to Rob Meyerson, who helped put together this amazing schedule of Ascend events. So, Rob, well done. As Dan mentioned, I'm Steve Isakowitz with the Aerospace Corporation, a federally funded research and development center dedicated to the nation's space enterprise. 
Today, I want to talk to you about the exciting moment we find ourselves at in our industry and what awaits us on the path ahead. 2020 was one of the most transformative years in the space enterprise in more than 50 years. We had the standup of the first launches under the US Space Force, the nation's first new military branch in over 70 years. In May, astronauts launched from US soil on a US built vehicle for the first time in nearly a decade through NASA's innovative commercial crew program. In June, we saw the first national security space launch aboard a booster that was later successfully recovered. And adversary nations continue to develop new threats to challenge US superiority in space. All of this sets the stage for a decade that promises to be the most dynamic time in space ever. In this emerging environment, the old rules of the road won't cut it. I repeat, the old rules of the road just won't cut it. Our entire concept of what we know about space and how we operate in space will be reshaped. We need to forge new partnerships, craft smart regulations, and usher in new ways of thinking about space. Ultimately, space is now a more contested domain and we can't take US dominance for granted any longer. We need to respond accordingly. At Aerospace, we have a unique perspective that comes from touching every part of the space enterprise, from military and intelligence users to civilian agencies and commercial players. To help spark an informed discussion about the many opportunities and challenges facing the US space enterprise in the coming years, Aerospace's Center for Space Policy and Strategy has put together a project called Space Agenda 2021. It is a series of 19 papers featuring in-depth looks at a range of topics that will shape the future of space activity, with the first four releasing this morning, and I will highlight them in my talk today. They are defense space partnerships, space traffic management, new services, regulatory oversight, and something we call continuous production agility. As an example of the new kinds of thinking we're talking about, Let's look at national security realm. On July 15th, Russia conducted a non-destructive test of a space-based anti-satellite weapon. In a statement acknowledging the activity, the chief of the US Space Force, General Jay Raymond, said that the test, the test was further evidence of Russia's efforts to develop and test space-based systems to put US and allied assets at risk. This test was conducted by the same satellite that early in the year was one of two Russian spacecraft that actively maneuvered near a classified US government satellite, behavior General Raymond called unusual and disturbing. This is only the latest demonstration of these types of capabilities. In 2017, Russia satellite exhibited characteristics of a weapon system, according to General Raymond, when it launched a high-speed projectile into space. The United States still leads in space, but Russia remains a threat, and China is taking great strides to close the gap. The US has several advantages, but perhaps our biggest one is that we don't have to manage these threats purely on our own. There is strength in numbers. The United States and its close partners make up 11 of the top 15 countries with the biggest national space budget. Together, they operate two thirds of roughly 2,700 active satellites on orbit and half of the 22 active space launch centers globally. This brings me to my first topic, defense space partnerships. The US has defense agreements with many of these countries but it had a limited success turning these relationships into space security relationships. It doesn't have to be that way. NATO's nuclear deterrence posture relies on a mix of US and allied capabilities. There are clear opportunities for defense partnerships in space to deter aggression and increase resiliency. What could that look like? First, it's important to note that real progress has been made in the last decade. There are dozens of existing bilateral agreements for space surveillance, cooperation, and data sharing. Funding from five partner nations went into the wideband global SATCOM satellite launched in 2017. And we're increasingly including foreign military participants in our space war games. More promising examples are already in motion. In late 2022, a US military communications payload will launch on a Norwegian satellite. The first launch of a US national security payload on a foreign satellite will save an estimated $900 million but continued progress won't happen on its own. We need to make it a strategic priority, not just an add-on to other agreements. We can expand and improve our respective networks and capabilities across greater geographic footprints using fewer resources. Japan, for instance, is developing deep space radar to observe objects in geosynchronous orbit, which could provide invaluable counter threat capabilities to the US. 
To enable progress in this area, we need to first coalesce allied and partner thinking on space security concepts and create a shared understanding of space threats and space conflict. We also have to overcome barriers related to classification levels and information sharing and develop standards for technology compatibility. These are encouraging signs, but more will need to be done on this front. Another area that will require international cooperation to address is around the issue of space traffic management, my second topic. In January of this year, a pair of defunct satellites came within 100 feet of one another somewhere over Pittsburgh, passing each other at a speed of almost 33 miles per hour. The collision could have created thousands of pieces of space debris that could linger in orbit for decades, threatening countless other spacecraft. Thankfully, that collision did not occur, but it underscores the days of thinking about space as a big sky where we could operate with few rules and few consequences. Those days are over. Orbits above Earth will significantly become more crowded in the coming decade, with an order of magnitude increase in commercial activity, driven by greater launch opportunities and lower costs to put spacecraft on orbit. Already the density of satellite overflights is affecting the scheduling of launch windows. We're going to see increasing diversity in the types of space operators outside traditional spacefaring nations, which will add complexity to coordinating space activities. The emergence of mega constellation concepts that could encompass hundreds or even thousands of satellites have the potential to fundamentally reshape the skies above us. SpaceX's Starlink is the most well-known current example and has launched nearly 800 satellites so far. Their future plans envision perhaps thousands more. The good news is orbital debris mitigation is one area, area where we already have success generating consensus around guidelines, standards, and best practices. Still, the U.S. needs to work with other countries to develop long-range vision for space traffic management practices and regulations. For the U.S., we need to organize streamlined regulatory structure for debris mitigation. That could include establishing the capability of civil space traffic management. We also need to work with commercial service providers, satellite operators, and international organizations to integrate data and develop a set of services to meet basic traffic management needs. Finally, acceptable levels for orbital debris and consequences for noncompliance will need to be established. The increasingly com complexity around space traffic managers in, in many ways is driven by the growth of the commercial sector. Now I'll pivot to my third topic, new services regulatory oversight. We're seeing private companies develop a range of new on-orbit capabilities, some of which had previously only been done by governments and others that are entirely new. These trends are accelerating and pose some startling possibilities as advancements in multiple capabilities converge. Take commercial remote sensing, which has seen a steady increase in the resolution of space-based platforms in recent years. Now we're seeing companies compete on things like multi-spectral capabilities, nighttime sensitivity, infrared, and synthetic aperture radar. These increasing imaging capabilities, when combined with future advancements in artificial intelligence and global connectivity through something like 5G, could create what we've dubbed the geospatial intelligence singularity. That's a future where real-time Earth observations with analytics are available globally to the average citizen. This combination of information, insight, and intelligence could be used to help you find an empty spot in a parking lot from space or manage a fleet of autonomous vehicles. But what would the availability of that type of ubiquitous real-time intelligence mean for military operators and the warfighter? The U.S. approach so far has been to regulate and limit the types and resolutions of imagery that can be taken from space. But that won't work as well for compelling capabilities of international companies or foreign governments. As the commercial sector grows, the U.S. will have to find ways to ensure safe and responsible behavior in space. Today, the regulatory authority is spread across several agencies. The Commerce Department, through NOAA and with input from DOD, is responsible for regulating space-based remote sensing operations like I just described. The FCC and the FAA also have responsibilities in the current regulatory framework. For many emerging services, the regulatory requirements are fuzzy at best. This includes things like satellite servicing through rendezvous and proximity ops. We should also expect questions to arise around space object ownership for debris removal purposes, commercial radio frequency collection, and technology exports. And then there are space tourism activities, and further out, the potential for commercial planetary missions that would raise the issue of planetary protection standards. 
none of these issues are going to be solved overnight. But the right time to start thinking about this is now, when there's still time to shape the trajectory and expectations of these emerging industries. We need to leverage technically sound insights to inform regulations that inform innovation and long-term sustainability. I want to talk briefly about the technological disruption that will be dri uh, driving these policies and regulatory issues, which brings me to my final topic, continuous production agility. We think modularity to enable high production volumes will be key to achieving the agility and efficiency needed to keep pace with the evolving adversary threats and the rapid changes taking place in space. The concept of modularity is used widely across countless commercial industries, from automobile manufacturing to software development. Think of automobile manufacturers who build multiple vehicle types using the same chassis, increasing their efficiency with each unit produced. Already we see these principles used in many types of defense procurement, just not in space. Spacecraft have typically been designed using highly reliable, but one-off designs that are intended to maximize performance. We think introducing modularity and widely accepted interoperability standards will be a key element in designing and future-proofing space architectures in a time of rapid change. We've encapsulated this idea in a concept we refer to as continuous production agility. CPA calls for a shift that favors speed, adaptability, and resilience. It treats space architectures as a combination of discrete elements that can be dynamically integrated. Some of these elements could be commercial off-the-shelf parts or purchase it as a service. A good example where we've seen this is successfully is in launch. Today, many satellites can switch between different launch vehicles because of standard interfaces. Payloads don't have to be designed for a specific rocket and could ins instead move between different vehicles of opportunity. Can we take that idea of modularity and interoperability and extend it to the way we design satellite sensors and ground systems? Right now, those are all largely still pipes. Realizing a CPA type strategy creates more frequent opportunities for technology insertion to provide agility to respond to threats and help drive innovation. It also improves efficiency by allowing re reuse of platforms across many systems and can simplify rapid prototyping efforts. Importantly, a shift to continuous production agility model can help foster a thriving ecosystem of space manufacturers and innovators that encourages new entrants. The recent reorganization of the Space and Missile Systems Center emphasizes an enterprise approach that encourages partnership and innovation, similar to the strategies called for by CPA. And we're seeing constellations designed for national security space being reimagined to incorporate modularity and high volume production concepts, such as the thinking by the Space Development Agency. We've only got a few minutes left and we've already covered a lot of ground today. You can read much more detailed discussion about today's topics in four new papers released today by visiting the Aerospace Corporation website. We have several more Agenda 2021 papers on national security space releasing in the coming weeks that I'm sure will be of great interest to you. Our paper on organizing for defense space considers what other reorganizations could be in store for the space enterprise after the standup of the US Space Force. We've also got a paper looking at what the changing strategic environment means for weaponization of space. Our space deterrence paper examines ways to strengthen the current value of US military space capabilities. Our Space Power Doctrine paper explores the ongoing discussions of how military space power is employed. And our Game Changers to Watch paper highlights emerging technologies that could have a significant impact on US space efforts in the near and midterm. When complete, Agenda 2021 will be a comprehensive look at space policy issues that the nation will face in the next presidential term. What I'd like to leave you with today is what made US dominant in space during the 20th century won't be enough to keep us ahead in the 21st century. We have a once in a lifetime opportunity to shape the future of space and potential benefits to humankind. The decisions we make today and in the coming decades will matter immensely and will determine what's possible for future generations. We have expertise, the technology and the ability to make sound decisions that contribute untold breakthroughs in space, but doing so will require leadership, vision, and cooperation, both between nations and with many emerging operators looking to utilize space in new and exciting ways. Thank you to the Ascendex organizers for allowing me to speak with you, and thank you for joining me here today. Wow, th thanks, Steve. Appreciate that. I'm looking forward to, uh, 
to catching up on that series of papers with Agenda 20, 2021. Uh, we've got time for, for one question. And uh, you know, all, all of what you're talking about um, sounds like digital transformation to me. Uh, and so how do we think about cybersecurity and resilience of data um, uh, in these systems that, uh, you know, related to space traffic management and all these new, new services that, that you're talking about? Yeah, thanks, Rob. You know, if, if you saw it in the Washington Post just the other day, Will Roper talked about digital engineering absolutely revolutionizing what's going to take for, uh, take uh, go forward in the Air Force and in space. Uh, they've introduced a new century series of something they call uh, e-aircraft and e-satellites, uh, uh, just to uh, get just like we had X-labeled uh, 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 vehicles in the past. And when, as we move into this more digital world, the question that you ask is really very critical. The thing I think we have learned time and time again is you have to think about cybersecurity up front when you're designing these systems and not later and after the fact. You also need to think about it in terms of multiple layers. There can't just be one way where they can break into your system and, and cause problems. I know later today uh, you have uh, a session that they're going to be talking about the uh, hackathon that was held as, as part of the DEF CON conference where in fact we invited uh, hackers to come in and to try to hack into our system so we can learn and see how they operate so we can be stronger in the future. So uh, mm -hmm. great question, Rob, and again, really appreciate being here today. Yeah, th thank you, Steve. We, we really appreciate having you, you here and, and what a way to kick off the summit. So thank you for that great presentation and discussion and the uh, announcement about your paper series. So for all of our attendees, now's the time when you get to focus in on one of the topic areas that Dan mentioned at the beginning of the session. Uh, in five minutes, the next sessions will start. So please uh, select your, your next adventure from the session lobby. We'll all get back together at the conclusion of the summit where I'll give some closing remarks. And until then, thanks for coming and go on and explore. <laughs>